In 2000, we bought an abandoned 100-acre farm in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We spent years cleaning it up, built a new house, and now are trying to make it a functional homestead farm. Welcome to Red Tool House. Well, welcome to another episode of our uh, Red Tool House uh, Lumber Company and Farm. Um, we hope this will be a very special episode, be a very heartfelt episode as we uh, cut down trees and saw wood and do other great things and give updates on the farm. So we hope you uh, will stick around and, and watch it all the way through the end and uh, appreciate you checking us out. Okay, an update on the pigs. It is uh, middle of January. It's a balmy six degrees this January morning and... Uh, the pigs are, are growing, as you can see, they're growing quite large, and uh, we're probably about seven, eight weeks out from processing. Uh, they're eating right around 200 pounds uh, a day in feed, uh, plus obviously any forage they find. So they're, uh, they're definitely uh, eating quite a bit, and uh, yeah, they're doing, doing alright with the cold. Uh, I've always worried about temperatures like this, it could be a problem with pastured pigs. They have access to the barn, they have access to the another building that they can get uh, shelter in uh, during the night. Uh, obviously they come up here and eat and get hopped up on all the feed, so, uh, so they'll have some calories to burn today. So they're doing pretty good. The feeding process I have right now is pretty rudimentary. Um, just a makeshift trough and some feed bowls. Uh, definitely uh, another infrastructure improvement I want to work on, um, looking at some of the larger feeders. Um, some of those feeders are upwards of a thousand dollars or more. Uh, just one of those things you have to justify that expense. Uh, right now, of course, taking two 100-pound feed sacks, opening up, uh, dispensing them into buckets, and, and walking around here inside uh, the area with the, the pigs to feed them out. Um, a little frustrating sometimes because obviously they bowl you over, but uh, um, so far I haven't had any, any real issues as far as uh, some people say, hey, you're, you're kind of you're foolish to get in there with them. They could knock you down and, uh, and cause some issues. Well, only real problem I've had is when someone like this one or this one stands on my my foot. Um, yeah, you, you have a 400-pound pig stand on the end of your toe. It, it does seem to hurt a little bit, but but that's something we'll work on next year and see about uh, uh, as we get more pasture cleared, uh, operating uh, um, the hog feeding area in, in, a, in a more of an enclosed building or, or even something that's mobile that we can move around if we go with the portable feeder route. Well, one of the other updates we wanted to talk about was our chickens. Uh, we have uh, 61 chickens. These are egg layers. Uh, they're kind of a cross between uh, uh, black australorf. We've got some Rhode Island red. Actually got one buff left. And then the new ones are the golden comets. Uh, the golden com that's a golden comet there. And the golden comets are, um, are our latest. They're actually not mature enough to lay eggs. They'll probably be another couple weeks out and they'll start laying. Uh, right now it's uh, middle of January, so if, if they decide to uh, come online, as we say, and, and start laying eggs, then that'll be the end of this month. And we're using the artificial light to, to kind of keep them stimulated to lay eggs, kind of keep the, keep the egg production going through the, through the wintertime. A um, little bit more wear and tear on the chickens. Uh, um, if, you, if you feel it's a little inhumane, you may not want to do that and, and let them go dormant. Uh, when they go dormant, you may only get one or two eggs out of a, a flock this size a day if you decide to not use artificial light. Uh, the light source also uses, uh, helps us heat. Uh, we put plastic up in the, the lining of our coop, and that helps all the heat from the chickens to, to uh, uh, from their bodies. Obviously, helps heat this room. This room is actually um, a lot warmer than it is outside, even though I've got the pop door open still and there's no insulation in the walls. So their body heat and this plastic does help kind of keep a shield there and keep them warm. Um, they, uh, we, we want to grow the flock. You can see the coop is probably a little small. Uh, it's actually really small. We need to expand the coop. Uh, you'll see in one of our other video segments how we're going to expand the pasture and we want to cons take that into uh, consideration when we, we add onto the coop, maybe add another 8x8 eight eight section onto the coop. Our goal is to continue adding egg laying, <laughs> continue adding egg laying chickens. Uh, we'd like to get up to about 100 layers is, is our goal at some point. 
Yeah, I just realized as I'm shooting this video, I'm standing here in my pajamas. That's kind of the, the, the day in the life. You just uh, realize something needs to be done, so you throw your boots on and go out and do it. And, and uh, probably not the most formal way to shoot a video, standing in your pajamas, but that's how things happen around here. Now here's a pop quiz. Try to guess who's in heat. Standing in the backyard, and I find this uh, standing right behind me. Uh, it seems the uh, four-wheeler is a... The sound of the four-wheeler is an incredible aphrodisiac. <laughs> so, uh, she showed up back here where I'm stacking firewood and, of course, is uh, completely frozen now that she's in standing heat. So, it's hilarious. I could knock her over. Um, she's completely, uh, completely locked up and looking for love. <coughs> Cue rooster. Okay, the majority of the episode this time is going to be talking about uh, felling a tree. We had this big red oak here <clears throat> on the edge of our, our new chicken pasture we want to expand. And uh, we're going to be putting a fence in. And I didn't want to uh, isolate that tree. If I put a fence in, there's no way I'm getting that tree out of there. It's a it's beautiful red oak. It's, it's almost getting to the size where we can't mill it. Uh, we can mill up to 33 inch in diameter log and it's getting dangerous close to that and of course as logs get heavier it just takes more wear and tear on the equipment it's just harder to move something that big so we wanted to focus on getting that down uh, getting it taken out get it to the mill and uh, then we can be be clear to, to start fencing in this area now one thing i want to stress um, what you'll see is uh, sometimes i'm not wearing proper safety equipment uh, even my brother is not wearing uh, eye protection uh, so that's a disclaimer here. Uh, if you're going to run a chainsaw, hopefully you know how to use it. You know, pointy end goes into the tree handle you hold on to. But um, yeah, just just follow the safety instructions, read your owner's manuals, all that type of stuff. Uh, nothing more fun than sticking a chainsaw in your in your face or in your leg or anything like that. It it could really obviously give you a bad day. So uh, disclaimer: make sure you wear all your safety equipment. Uh, do what I say, not what I do. I guess would be a, appropriate here. But also want to point out my brother, his name's Thad. Thad is a <clears throat> trainer for the state. He trains uh, state employees on how to properly cut, uh, cut down trees, chainsaw work. So he's going to show us a technique that is employed by the state. Uh, it's, a, it's a really neat way to do it. Some of you guys may be familiar with it. If you're like me, I was the old, uh, you know, cut out the wedge and back cut and you're, and you're, you're done. And, and you, you kind of could try to steer it some sometimes you couldn't but uh, but this way I, I think works a lot better a lot more efficient especially when you're working with bigger trees it's going to give you more control give you more time to get it set so so we're going to focus on that this episode and and uh, yeah, document that we've got some good footage of that entire process of bringing that tree down and taking it to the mill so I hope you enjoy well for today's adventure we're going to cut down this big red oak right here as we want to expand our pasture for the chickens uh, we want to get this out of the way simply because it'll be It'll be isolated with the fence, and that's a really nice red oak. It's almost too big to mill. So we want to get it cut so we can use it for other things like uh, barn wood and, and uh, woodworking uh, wood. So we just want to get it out of the way and get that taken care of. So we want to strategically lay it down in the right way. So we'll see how that works. See if we flatten everything. Pick up my saw when you're done. <laughs>
So you're making like a mouth opening. When you cut a bird's mouth notch, what I train is you want the opening to be such that it won't close. Okay. Until it's way downfield. Yeah. And you don't want to close before the the uh, tree hits the ground. That makes sense. Because the old way of doing a horizontal and then a top wedge, well, you'd, you'd, you'd have that. Well, you top wedge to protect yourself. Yeah. If you cut this bird's mouth notch wide enough, it won't barber chair. Okay. See, that's what was happening was they were barber chair and breaking their wedge. Yeah. Breaking their hinge. Gotcha. <laughs> Facilitate this canopy touching the ground mm -hmm. without this angle closing. Yeah. So what you want to do now is you estimate the diameter of the tree. So let's just say it's two and a half, three feet. Every 12 inches, you want an inch of hinge. hinge. Oh, okay. That'll protect you from this side and it'll protect you from that side. So this is going to be tough because I don't have a bar long enough, but what we'll do, we'll do a plunge cut three inches back parallel to this angle here mm -hmm. that'll then we'll cut back towards the back of the tree that'll give us areas to put our wedges in okay that'll keep you from cutting into your wedges too okay cool when you uh, plunge cut you gotta go in high rpm you're supposed to be somewhat perpendicular to the tree but that's gonna be tough since i can't hover right yeah so i gotta put it at a weird angle and come in behind here okay Your strongest wood is your sapwood. Yeah. So yeah, I need my axe. So I set it out of the four wheelers on the ground over there by my saw. Your sapwood's holding all this. Yeah. See, all yeah. you've got now holding this tree is this back part. Okay. Now you've got plenty of room for your wedges behind your hinge. There's two more. Yeah, we'll hammer these in. See. Okay. So you're using the wedge to steer it for pretty much that direction. <laughs> Every inch here in theory is 10 feet up there close okay. 8 to 10 depending on the height of the tree of course and everything yeah it looks like you maintained a pretty good pretty good wedge there it looks three or four inches all the way through yeah, or a hinge see, i should say not a wedge yeah, if the if it was level it wouldn't be a problem but it, I, I had to cut it at a sloping angle there up to where i started now obviously this for a big tree you you have this technique what about a smaller tree so maybe this like that scrub thing over there where you wouldn't necessarily have all this ability to do that. Did you scale everything down, make your bird's mouth much, yeah, much smaller? Exactly. And Yeah, remember, if it's 
12 inch diameter tree use a one inch hinge. Yeah. Look at, look at a sap running out of that thing. That's amazing too. Yeah. I guess because we're hot and cold. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we've had it such a tree doesn't know what to do. Had such a warm December, it's surprised it hadn't butted out yet. So we're gonna be a little bit off back here on this cut. But it should as heavy and big as this tree is, it should go ahead and pull itself right. Yeah. So you've once you've got these wedges in place and you feel comfortable the direction you're going, then you're just gonna come back and cut a just cut that just relief get out. As close as you can to here. What I'll probably do is start on this side. Yeah. Because this is my uncomfortable side. Yeah. And then finish on my comfortable side. Okay. And that should always do your first work on your most uncomfortable side because you you spend less time there, if that makes sense. Tree's crying. Yep. Can't decide. There's the end is coming. Just I need those wedges, please. Oh, I saw Dad put them in the pocket. I thought he was taking. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that Alex. Ah, sorry. It's all right. That's a weather plastic. <laughs> Tell you what, we'll, just so you can learn, we'll do we'll do something else here too. Okay, so you don't have any more room. Those are hitting solid. Yeah. So you don't have any more room for wedges. Cut more of your plunge out. Yeah, I see. Give you more. You, if you cut a tree this way, you have all the time in the world. Even if it's a windy day. If you're four rock, you're in trouble. Substantial amount more, but we still have a lot of. Still got a lot of meat back here. Yeah, like you talked about, the the cambium or the sapwood is the most strongest. Is the strongest, it's not the hardest. So it's going to hold on to it. See how easy that one will. Yeah. Get three more. If you need yeah, sure wouldn't hurt. So those are still hitting solid. So that tells you. Yeah. But remember, it can go at any time. Sure. Especially if you got core rod or weak spots, you never trust it. Ooh, those are brand new. Fancy pants. So you're gonna cut a little bit more out? Yeah. Push. Mm -hmm. So you can never go in like that. Right. You always go in from the bottom. So Even if you've already out. got a hole, yeah. highest RPM you got. Okay. Max it out. So. Alright buddy. It's getting ready to come down. You uh, broke. Here's probably the best point to make of, of this technique. There's only, see the cut there? Yeah. There's only this much holding this entire tree. Yeah. It hadn't yeah. moved at all. And we're talking just inches of yeah. those sapwood. But that's that sapwood. These are all hitting solid still. So, there's good and bad to it too. Because it's a big tree and that sapwood is amazing. I would like to be able to come through here. And, yeah, that one's moving a little bit more. Yeah. That tells me we're moving. See, that one's moving yeah. now. So what we'll do is we'll start at the back and keep adding these and watch and see if these these move. Open up if they bit. do, that tells us that we're putting all of our stresses where we yeah. want to go. Influencing the tree to go to the left there. Okay. 
that pool wedge right there is probably going to get nicked. That's see how, can see them all moving now? Yeah. Yeah, it's dad's wedge, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. See, look how good that part Yeah. Is. So just incremental advancing is going to move that tree and influence the direction that we want it to go, yeah. I'd like to get that one in there, but ain't going to happen. Yeah. So, let's see if we can. See, that tells you that tree's moving. There's no way in the world those hinges should allow you to do that if they weren't moving. See how much time you got? Yeah. We take all day doing this. Check your lean. It looks like it hadn't moved much at all, but it should be pretty stable, so it's ready to release. Alright. Want to release it? No, go ahead. I'll document. Tell your chickens to save it first. Alright. We'll cut over here first. Cover here first. We'll watch it. <laughs> Awesome. Good work. Great was the fall. Very nice. Uh, again, now the critique. I always go back when I train these guys and critique it. Obviously, I'm way off here. Yeah. Which is to be expected. But the most important spot where I wasn't too far off was behind this hinge. Yeah, where your hinge was created. Yeah. See, the hinge looks bad here. You're thinking, wow, you didn't leave much of a hinge. Look down it's all, there. It's all down on the tree. Right. Yeah. It pulls it out. Now, loggers will cringe because you, they see hair sticking up out of the stump, but if you notice, the stump's the one that suffered the, the cutout, the pullouts, yeah. whereas the big, the, the, the market wood didn't. Yeah. Well, you can see here, this is the small amount of sapwood that held that tree, and sure. then of course it cracked along the grain, which yeah. it would naturally, like a sweater. And you saw, we felt it pop. So we're like, okay, we know that it's getting serious now. We did that without even cutting Dad's new wedge out. So. Yeah. Where's the new wedge? I think it was the one that made it to the ground. He picked yeah, it. Yeah, it pulled down with it. Because these are my, two. these are my four here. Yeah, I got my two. Where's the third one? It's here somewhere. Oh no, I didn't. Get, it wouldn't go in. Yeah, yeah. I need to cut that tab off. All right. Well, good work, Thaddeus. Thank you. You are a true loser. Lumberjack. Lumberjack. Loser Jack. All right. Well, so in summary, what we're going to do is we're going to cut this up. A lot of this is going to go to the mill and obviously produce some gorgeous red oak. Uh, for hopefully woodworking, barn wood, whatever we've got. That's you know, a ton of wood laying there. The rest, of course, will be used for firewood. And like I said, we're going to put this fence line in here. And, and we didn't want to cordon off this, uh, this tree and, and not be able to use it uh, once we had fence in. So we're just trying to be proactive in how we prepare our pasture. This Takes care of that. We got it all cleaned up. The logs are uh, ready to be staged, and we're going over to the sawmill next to mill. So we may get a little footage of that as well, since we're making a day of it. Did you say footage? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be bootage. Yeah. A little chance for a little chainsaw uh, artwork here with the. Uh, it's too heavy to move. It'll be the chicken throne when I get this. <laughs> hey, you can leave it in here. Let the chickens poop on it. That's what I was thinking. Well, they, they need a little bit of playground stuff. So. Oh, playground. It's a, it's a chicken throne. All right. All right, well, as you can see, we're at the mill now and got the logs loaded and transported. Um, Dad's actually finishing up, uh, he's finishing up some cedar right now and then we'll get these unloaded and get them milled up. But we'll uh, check it out here.
Here in woodworking, people talk about quarter sawn oak or quarter sawn sycamore or anything quarter sawn for that matter. And basically, what quarter sawn means is when you cut through the log, you're leaving the grain in a vertical position. If you see up here where we're cutting through right now, this would be flat sawn. The, the rings of the tree are actually more flat. They're parallel with the surface of the board. So this board is, uh, if you cut an inch and a half off of this board, this board is going to be less stable uh, at expansion and contraction. This, this grain actually wants to, with the relief cut, it's actually going to want to curl up. So if we left this alone and it dried out, it would actually curl up like a potato chip. With quarter sawn, you can imagine if we kept cutting down through here, we'd be down to this point and all the grain is vertical. That makes for a much stronger board. It's going to be more stable. It's not going to want to curl up or curl out. And so that's more coveted. And you can imagine if you could 
if you could take this log and turn it like a dial's on a clock, then you could get quarter sawn out of everything, but that's obviously not logical. So usually what sawmills do, the professional guys, they'll, they'll come through and they'll cut the center out and then they'll take this and, and turn it sideways and mill it and take this portion and turn it sideways and mill it and they can take this portion and turn it sideways and mill it. So it's just a matter of how often you rotate the log that you can get the quarter sawn out. Well, one thing we learned the hard way on the farm is don't do things in a manner that you have to come back and redo them. Uh, you find yourself tripping over stuff. Uh, you, you think, okay, I'm just going to throw this together real quick and I'll come back and put it, put it in nicer and when I get more time. Uh, that usually just costs you more time. It costs you an aggravation. And uh, since things go by so fast, they sneak up on you before you know it. One perfect example are these fence posts. Uh, again, since we're dealing with, with hogs, we don't have to worry about them leaping over six foot fences it's it's not an issue with a hog he's he's not that uh, agile to be leaping over stuff so what i did as we were clearing land i had all these these small saplings and things and i thought well i'm just gonna just gonna split these and drive them in the ground and uh, if, if these are where i'm going to keep the pasture fence lines then uh, then i'll come back and put permanent posts in well, what i discovered is i did like the the location of where i put these posts but these posts as you can see this one behind me this one's poplar and right now, if I go up and I just touch it, it's going to snap off at the ground. Poplar is a, and I knew this doing it, poplar is one of those woods that are just, you just don't stick them in the ground. They're just not going to last. Obviously, a lot of the hardwoods are like that. Locust is the obvious post to put in the ground. That's what farmers use for, forever before everybody switched to treated, was taking locust uh, trees and splitting them and driving them into the ground as posts. Uh, but this poplar, it just, it just soaks up water super quick. It rots out, so I could literally go there and just push it and it would snap off. The camera's sitting on another one, <clears throat> so I probably have seven or eight of them here in this pasture area that, uh, you know, hard wind or a, or a white-tailed deer runs into it and it's broken off and then I've got a uh, hole in my fence. And you can see behind there, I've got two other posts that I've replaced with a fiberglass post and a metal post. And it's one of those things where, again, trying to save time and, and effort at the beginning is, is causing more headache on down the road. So it's one of those things I, I'd really suggest looking at uh, your plan, if you're going to build something, you're going to throw something together real quick or put something together, uh, just think it through. If it's something that you're going to have to replace, these posts aren't even two years old yet. So that's how quickly they rot it out. And they're pretty good sized posts. They're you know, four or five inch diameter tree that we split in half. So uh, you'd think it would, it would hold up better. Uh, but once you put poplar in the ground, it's, it's pretty much done. So, so just look at that when, you, uh, when you're doing projects. Uh, if, if it's the easy way out, there's probably a reason why it's the easy way out and it's going to come back and bite you at some point. Well, as we talked about, I like to do um, product reviews. Um, I hate to call it that, but it's about the only thing I can think of. But just things we use on the farm that we really like or things we use on the farm that we absolutely hate and we'll never use again. And one thing that we really like in, uh, this is kind of a shameless capitalistic promotion, but um, these, uh, um, there's an apparel line called StormTech. It's a Canadian company, and they rival some of the other large outdoor apparel uh, companies as far as construction and build. Their name really hadn't been established as well yet. Uh, my, my company, uh, my, my day job, we uh, represent that uh, apparel line in, uh, in West Virginia. But this is one of those. This is, this is a StormTech. I call this my crab fisherman outfit. Uh, it basically is, uh, it's completely waterproof, it's like a crab fisher, uh, crab fisherman's uh, getup that you'd see in Alaska or whatever. But this is a, kind of a pullover poncho, things extremely warm, but it's really waterproof, of course it even has the reflective elements. Not quite sure I need the reflective here on the pig farm, or unless maybe I get lost and Kelly's looking for me. But um, just really like the warmth element of it. It's got you know, some fleece lining here, um, like I said right now it's 6 degrees, and I'm extremely warm obviously. 
running around carrying 100 pound feed sacks helps uh, get your body core up. But um, they make this pullover, and of course they even make the bibs. I'm not wearing the bibs. I, I uh, didn't purchase those yet. Um, but just a really nice garment. And then you have five in one systems. So like I have another one that's uh, a five in one system. So it's almost like a, a big heavy ski jacket would be a good analogy uh, or a good example of what it would be. And uh, when we had minus 20 degree temperatures last year, uh, I wore that thing bundled up and, and took care of all my chores without any trouble. So I really like that, I like that line. I definitely give that a thumbs up. That is a, that is a great product line. Um, a little bit expensive, but, um, but you know, obviously worth, worth the money. And they do everything from uh, you know, all the way down to golf shirts. Uh, you just want to be casual wear. But their outdoor uh, apparel is just, just awesome. So, you know, the, the rain ratings and all those, even on some of their uh, hooded fleeces and those type of things, have really good water resistant ratings. Uh, so check it out, uh, stormtechusa.com, uh, I believe is the, uh, the USA link that you can, you can look at. And if, obviously, if you want to <laughs> get some off us, uh, just contact us and we can show you how to do it. But uh, uh, really neat stuff. Well, this brings us to the end of another riveting episode. Um, I guess we could say this was a woody theme, this episode. Um, but as always, we would like for you to give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Uh, thumbs up really help us with our rankings and help us with uh, other people to find us and kind of gives us encouragement that you guys are actually liking what you're seeing instead of pointing and laughing. Um, so if you would please, thumbs up, that really helps us. Um, subscribe, be sure to hit the subscribe button that you'll get notifications that, uh, that we have another video out. And again, that kind of helps keep the ball rolling. Again, uh, visit redtoolhouse.com for our website and back history of the farm. And we update the blog on a, on a semi-regular basis. And, uh, of course, like us on Facebook. If you go to facebook.com forward slash Red Toolhouse and give us a like there and you can follow our uh, uh, latest updates there as well. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode and uh, stay tuned. We'll have some other, other good things coming up as we continue to uh, advance our efforts on this farm. Take care. <laughs>